Dude, I would lose my mind. Oh my God. That is so... Oh my God. I would do illegal things at that point. AM Glimpse is coming out with some bangers after bangers. Let's take a look at this one, maybe, when the contests go horribly wrong. A Nintendo Wii, a fistful of cash, naming rights, and even a jet. All of these were prizes and contests that have gone horribly wrong for different reasons. Corporate errors or miscalculations are usually the blame. But what happens when actual human lives are lost as a result? Nintendo Wii, tomorrow morning, are you ready? Absolutely. Um, it's for my wife. Are you a good holder? <laughs> I, I think so. On January 12th. 2007, oh, I remember this. Sacramento radio station KDND's morning rave show held an on-air contest called Hold Your Wee for a Wee. Basically, contestants in the studio had to drink as much water as they could without urinating. Whoever drank the most would win a Nintendo Wii console. Jennifer Strange, a 28-year-old mother of three, was one of the 17 contestants that day. She was eager to win the Wii for her kids as they were sold out all she didn't even uh she didn't even die because she held her pee. She died because she drank a lot of water, right? Isn't that what it was? She got water poisoned. Almost everywhere at the time. Contestants were each handed Boiler eight alerts or 240 milliliter bottles of water to drink at 15 minute intervals. The quantities of water got increasingly larger as the competition progressed, and people would drop out when their bladders got too full. To make contestants drop out faster, the rules kept changing. The intervals would decrease to just 10 minutes. Then eventually, the few final contestants had to finish up their bottles of water in two minutes. Jennifer Strange ended up coming second in the competition after drinking close to two gallons or 7.5 liters of water over three hours. She repeatedly mentioned her head hurting and feeling lightheaded, but the radio hosts didn't seem concerned. Jennifer, I heard that it's not, you're not doing too well. My head hurts. Oh. They keep telling me that it's the, the water, that it's my, it'll tell my head to hurt and then it'll make me puke, but. I, who, who told you that, the intern? Yeah. That's one of those over there. Like, it kind of, it makes you, it hurts, but it makes you feel lightheaded, so I'm not sure if I'm just like. This is what it feels like when you're drowning. There's a lot of water inside of you. Oh, it hurts. They even joked about how her bloated stomach made her appear pregnant. At one point, a nurse called in warning how dangerous drinking too much, too much water can be. I want to say that um, those people that are drinking all that water can get sick and possibly die from water intoxication. Yeah, we're aware of that. We're, that's yeah, they, we're said, they said releases, so we're not responsible. It's okay. Oh, no, it's good. Okay, got it. Never mind. Guys, guys, I was, I was about to have uh, 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 humanity, and then I realized they signed releases, dude. Okay, sick. Oh, okay, got it. Never mind. Then fuck them. They, they should die then. Okay. The nurse recommended giving the contestants salt or a sports drink like Gatorade to help replenish their sodium levels. But the contestants couldn't even hear the broadcast, and the advice was disregarded by the hosts. They joked several times throughout the show about contestants dying and how they were not liable because of the waivers that were signed. Oof. Hey, Carter, is anybody, is anybody dying in there? Uh, we got a guy who's just about to die. <laughs> oh, good. Make sure you sign I like that, that we laugh at that. Do these guys go to jail? Yeah. Make sure he signs the release. Get the insurance on that, please. At the end, Jennifer was awarded Justin Timberlake concert tickets for being the first runner-up. After the contest was over, Jennifer's head pains worsened. She called her colleague Laura Riots in tears saying that she was suffering from an intense headache. Laura called Jennifer's mother, who rushed to her daughter's home in Rancho Cordova. Jennifer had- See, a lot of people constantly tell me, Hassan, why the fuck are you drinking so much Mountain Dew? I will never die of uh, water poisoning, okay? Died in her Think. home just six hours after the contest ended. A coroner's report revealed that Jennifer had died- No- they have some pretty dog shit lives now, though. Don't worry. The main brother's guy killed a bunch of people recently. Wait, what? The main guy's brother killed a bunch of people recently? What the fuck? These guys are just like, they can't stop doing murders? What's happening? Died of water intoxication. The rapid consumption of water created an imbalance of electrolytes, which caused the brain and cells in her body to swell. The Sacramento County Sheriff's Department announced that they would not be investigating Jennifer's death. As why? Because they were probably fans of the fucking show. That's why. How do you not investigate that? Everyone knows who killed her. Like, how is that not illegal? Like, how are you not endangering people? Like, you literally can just, like, sign your life away? What is happening in America, man? 
actually what the fuck is happening in the United States of America. Brother, you can't you can't just be like, hey guys, uh today we're gonna fucking bungee jump or something. And then like uh and after like the eleventh time that people are bungee jumping, like the wires are actually uh becoming very dangerous and can snap. And people are calling in to be like, hey, uh the wires can snap. You probably should stop. And then and then they're like, oh, well, they signed a waiver. Who cares? Like, there's no, the waiver is not, people literally think that, people literally think that, like, if you sign a waiver, then, you know, your rights, you've signed your rights away. That's not the case. You could still sue, and you should still sue. In this situation, the government should do something about it, which is wild that they didn't, because it's not like a, yeah, it's not like a fucking spell that they cast, like a protective spell that they cast over themselves like you can't put someone under undue risk like there is still such a thing as criminal negligence you know there was no evidence of criminal misconduct the morning rave show was immediately cancelled and 10 radio station staff members were fired including the three on-air hosts adam lucas cox steve maney and patricia trish sweet on january 18th 2007 Jennifer's husband, William Strange, filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the radio station's parent company, Entercom. The trial began in September 2009 in Sacramento. Attorney Roger Dreyer, who was representing the Strange... Yeah, that's the other part of it. You can't sign your life away. They put Dr. Gavorkian in jail for like 30 years for assisted suicides. Exactly. Like, what the fuck? And some of those people literally like were terminal cancer patients. You know what I mean? Like they wanted to alleviate pain. My man said Gavorkian, by the way. I met Dr. Kavorkian when I was 12. Damn. Was he trying to kill you? What's happening? Family argued that Jennifer's death was completely preventable and that the radio station was well aware that their contest could lead to a death. No medical professionals were ever consulted, nor was there a doctor in the studio on the day of the contest, and several contestants had complained of pain and discomfort throughout the morning. Prior to the contest starting, the hosts even mentioned the case of Matthew Carrington, a 21-year-old college student who had died of water intoxication during a fraternity hazing. The hosts used Matthew's death to depict the edginess of their contest and attract more listeners. Oh my God, they literally fucking, Jesus. Jesus Christ, they already, they absolutely knew that you could die from water intoxication. That's why they were kept making jokes about it. On October 29th, 2009, the jury awarded Jennifer Strange's family $16.5 million in damages and found Entercom Sacramento to be 100% at fault for her death. They should also, they fucking should have sued the, the police too for not prosecuting the DJ. Here's the main DJ's family history sins. In his book, Cox wrote that he struggled to find work after Strange's death, but nobody was going to hire a DJ with a reputation as a killer. I was branded with a cruel and false charge, he wrote in his book. He has since found work at other radio stations. Now Cox is listed among 48 potential witnesses the prosecution could call in its case against his sister, Lori. Lori is currently being held on $1 million bond at the Rexburg, Idaho jail and faces two counts of felony desertion of a child and the disappearance of her children, Joshua J.J. Wallow, 7, and Tylee Ryan, 17, who were last seen in September. Lori also faces misdemeanor charges of resisting and obstructing an officer, solicitation of crime and contempt according to the Madison County, Idaho Prosecutor's Office, Lori's older, Lori's other brother, Alex Cox, died December 12th, and his death is currently under investigation. On July 11, 2019, Alex shot and killed Lori's fourth husband, Charles Wallow. Alex told the police he acted in self-defense when he shot Charles, according to the body cam footage released by Chandler Police Department. Alex was not in charge in the incident. Wait, this is that Lori? This is the, the, yeah, this lady is the... Uh, the sister of the DJ. They have since found Lori's kids dead and buried at the property. That's wild, dude. Death. The KDND radio station was shut down in February 2017. In 1984, PepsiCo introduced a lottery-style promotional campaign to win market share against its rival, Coca-Cola. A three-digit number and a cash prize amount were printed on the underside of the bottle cap of every PepsiCo drink. Each day, a different winning number would be announced, and the holders of the bottle caps could redeem a prize. The campaign was a huge success in the United States and South America, and was eventually rolled out in the Philippines in February 1992. 
Uh oh. The prizes ranged from 100 to 1 million pesos, which was the equivalent to 40,000 US dollars in 1992, and was over 600 times the average monthly salary in the Philippines at the time. Every night, the winning number would be announced on the evening news program TV Patrol. The numbers were carefully controlled and there was a very small number of bottle caps bearing the 1 million pesos prize in circulation. The campaign was hugely popular and a massive success for Pepsi sales. Over the next few months, Pepsi increased its market share in the Philippines from 19.4% to 24.9%. By the time the campaign ended on the 8th of May, 51,000 people had won the smallest prize of 100 pesos, while 17 lucky people took home the 1 million. The number fever campaign was such a hit that it got extended for another five weeks. That's when disaster struck. On the evening of May 25th, 1992, hundreds of thousands of people across the Philippines tuned into TV Patrol to see what the winning number was as they had done every night for the past few months. That night, the number was 349. However, 349 had already been allocated as a non-winning number during the original run of- My Starfield is downloaded already. I, I don't even know if I can play it yet though. Okay, it's gonna take some time to unpack, but it's unpacking time. All right, let's continue. But everybody knows I hate Todd Howard because he's white. Of the campaign. So there were 800,000 of them floating around the Philippines. Usually, only a few people would turn up to Pepsi bottling plants to collect major prizes. But that night, tens of thousands of ecstatic people came forward to redeem their prize. Some households even had more than one winning bottle cap. They all thought they had just become millionaires. An emergency meeting was called at 3 a.m. and PepsiCo Philippines executives determined a computer error resulted in the incorrect announcement of the winning number. The following morning, a different winning number, 134, was announced by the newspapers, indicating that that was meant to be the real winning number, but it just added to the confusion. A few days later, it was announced that PepsiCo would be offering 500 pesos as a gesture of goodwill to those who held 349 bottle caps. About 486,000 people accepted, but thousands of people were still demanding their rightful prize of 1 million pesos. Peaceful protests were held outside the PepsiCo head offices and the government buildings. 349 claimants formed organized consumer groups and called for a boycott of Pepsi products. However, the protests escalated and turned into violent riots over the coming months. PepsiCo executives began to receive death threats and dozens of company trucks were attacked, overturned or burned. On February 13, 1993, a Molotov cocktail was thrown at a Pepsi truck in Manila and sadly, a school teacher named Anacida Rosario and an unnamed five-year-old girl were killed with several others getting injured. In May 1993, Jesus a grenade was thrown into a Pepsi warehouse in Davao and killed three employees. About 22,000 people took legal action against PepsiCo, 700 civil suits and 5,200 criminal complaints for fraud and deception were filed. A $400 million class action suit was even filed against PepsiCo in New York, but ended up being dismissed. In January 1993, Pepsi paid a fine of 150,000 pesos to the Department of Trade and Industry for violating the conditions of their promotion. In June 1996, plaintiffs in one of the lawsuits were each awarded 10,000 pesos, about 380 US dollars at the time. That's crazy. The lawsuit was escalated to the Philippine Supreme Court, and in 2006, it was ruled that PepsiCo could not be liable for any more damages and the issues surrounding the 349 incident were laid to rest. In 1996, PepsiCo would be embroiled in another promotional campaign gone wrong, this time in its home country, the United States. Pepsi Stuff was the largest promotional campaign in the company's history and another effort to win market share against its rival Coca-Cola. It was simple. Customers would accrue Pepsi points when they bought Pepsi products, which could be exchanged for items like t-shirts, jackets, sunglasses, bags, and bikes. Pepsi stuff catalogs and order- This was such- This was so poppin' back then. Like, Camel did this too for cigarettes. Uh, I think even Marlboro did it. This shit was fire. 
forms were distributed across the country. The total value of all the merchandise was a hundred. I assume we're going to find out that it wasn't fire, but <laughs> considering that the title is when contests go horribly wrong. $125 million. The TV ad for the campaign featured a Harrier fighter jet valued at $37.4 million at the time and was depicted with a price tag of 7 million Pepsi points. 21 year old business student, John Lennon. Oh my God, wait, they got this from dude. Dude, wait, isn't that from when they sold Pepsis to USSR? They had literally a fucking, uh, they had a carrier. No, it's a Harrier, but like, didn't, didn't Pepsi also at one point, like around this time, uh, own a actual Harrier as a US Marine jet? Okay, but like, maybe they fucking got the Harrier in exchange for like, uh, a, a a sub like a russian sub well it wasn't just a sub it was all, like an aircraft carrier i'm pretty sure yeah pepsi once had the sixth largest navy in the world ussr and and pepsi cut a deal where the soviet union would provide vodka from a state-owned brand stolichnaya for resale in the u.s in exchange for pepsi and um, and then by late 80s the ussr's agreement with pepsi was due to expire however unlike in previous years their vodka wouldn't be enough to satisfy the american company so uh uh, due to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, which led to American people boycotting Russian products, including vodka, Swedish vodka, absolute, uh, quickly suppressed Stolichnaya. The Soviets didn't want to lose Pepsi, so they opted for a rather unorthodox trade with the soda company. In exchange for his product, they gave Pepsi a fleet of ships, including 17 submarines, a frigate, a cruiser, and a destroyer. Oh, I guess they... Donald Kendall responded saying, I'm dismantling the Soviet Union faster than you are from Seattle, Washington, saw the ad and decided to test if he could win himself a fighter jet. Initially, he attempted to buy Pepsi products to accumulate the points, but quickly realized that he wouldn't be able to ever buy 7 million cans or bottles of Pepsi. He examined the label on the bottle and noticed fine print that revealed that Pepsi points could be purchased for 10 cents each. He realized that in theory, he could buy himself a $37 million fighter jet for just $700,000. Of course, John didn't have that kind of money, so he turned to his friend, Todd Hoffman. Todd was a millionaire businessman in his 40s. The unlikely friends met on a mountaineering trip in Alaska, where John was working as a guide. They both shared a rebellious and adventurous spirit, and Todd immediately agreed to help raise the money for the jet. With a this is literally the most American story of all time, dude. I can't even wrap my brain around the Americanness of this fucking story. It's still unpacking. It's at 106 gigs, by the way. With five investors behind him, John sent Pepsi a check for $700,000, along with 15 bottle labels he had collected himself. A couple of months later, John received a letter from PepsiCo explaining that the jet was not part of the Pepsi Stuff catalog and therefore was not able to be redeemed. They explained that the jet depicted in the ad was a joke and solely for entertainment purposes. That's bullshit. That's bullshit. He deserves the jet. Give him the fucking fighter jet right now. And return the $700,000 check. Dissatisfied, John hired a lawyer who hit back at Pepsi, pointing out that the commercial did not carry a disclaimer about the jet and demanded that they make arrangements for it to be transferred to John or they would take legal action against them. PepsiCo went to court first to get John's claims to be declared frivolous. John responded by filing Files are his being own verified. lawsuit demanding the jet. The case was brought to the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York, where John alleged both breach of contract and fraud on PepsiCo's part. In August 1999, Judge Kimber Wood ruled in favor of PepsiCo. That's so fucked up. God damn it, I hate this fucking court system. Dude, dude. That's not just fraud. That's $700,000 worth of fraud. That is such unimaginable bullshit. Like, yeah, you don't get the fucking jet, but Pepsi should absolutely pay financial compensation. What the fuck? And it was found that the jet depicted in the TV commercial did not constitute an offer under contract law. That's the so fucked up. The court also found that any reasonable person would understand that the jet was intended to be a joke and not to be taken literally. Judge Wood also added in her statement, quote, The callow youth featured in the commercial is a highly improbable pilot, one who could barely be trusted with the keys to his parents' car, 
much less the prized aircraft of the United States Marine Corps. The court also found that there was no case for fraud as Pepsi never cashed John's check. Pepsi Co Dude, this is fucking wanton corruption straight up. It, it, it's just like, it's, I'm not even joking right now. I'm not, I'm so serious. Like, the Taco Bell pizza is like a Taco Bell flatbread and it's false advertising, yada, yada, whatever. This, on the other hand, Oh my God, his lawyer was Michael Avenatti. Oh, that's why he lost. Oh no, that's why he lost because he had Michael Avenatti as his lawyer. Fucking legal counsel, Michael Avenatti, who himself is in prison, so. Oh, that's crazy. Oh, you done fucked up. You done goofed. You done goofed big time. Okay, this unironically, this unironically is, is a miscarriage of justice. And the only reason why they were able to fucking get away with this is because Pepsi was a massive corporation and this guy was some random fucking hired. This guy was a random dickhead. That's it. Okay. And also because he hired foolishly Michael Avenatti. Um it, this is this is completely unacceptable. That is false advertising. Like there is no better way to describe false advertising than that. The case is correct from a legal perspective and its justifications are correct too. There's no way how that it's unreasonable to assume that you're actually going to win the jet if they never s specify that you are not going to win the jet and they show it as a part of the sweepstakes. It absolutely is not. After they got his letter, they re-edited the ad to say the fighter jet wasn't included. Well, that implies that they also... Okay, that implies that they also rec recognize that they fucked up. You can't just, like, post hoc change that shit. Like, how do you not put that in the fine print? That's crazy, dude. I, I don't believe that for a second. That I was like, unironically, uh, a, a solid legal uh, precedent. Co continued to run the Pepsi Stuff campaign and aired the commercial, but updated the cost of the jet to $700 million. Look it up. The case was super rigged. She didn't allow for a jury and a bunch of other bullshit. I feel like a reasonable person would know it's crazy impossible to win the jet, but I still think it's a real offer. Yeah. The impossibility comes from it being $700,000 worth of Pepsi points, dog. That's where the impossibility comes from. Actually, more than that. The fine print is where they fucked up and allowed them to purchase it for $0.10. Cents. Like, it's not sweepstakes. They could buy the points, so it clearly wasn't made to be bought one one-thousandth of the price. No, dude. No fucking shot. You can't just, like, say you're going to give a carrier, unironically just say that you're going to give a carrier, and then have people, like, join the uh the competition and then turn around and be like just kidding we were just lo lol <laughs> i'm using the just kidding defense i mean you can't do that as an average american but pepsico can because they can go judge shopping and find uh you can go judge shopping and find a judge that is uh way more favorable to massive corporations who will then turn around and and uh and and defend your uh irresponsible behavior Every sweepstakes has one of those insane prizes worth the most points. Not completely unreasonable to think this one would too. Yeah. Bro, I hope you're joking because whatever you say, the chat agrees with you. Guys, I, I'm very clearly not saying he deserves to get a fucking fighter jet. Please understand what I'm saying. I'm saying that he should have gotten damages. He should have gotten some kind of compensation for motherfucking... Like, when I say, oh, he should get the fighter jet, I'm joking. That part is a joke. But, like, the fact that they 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 uh, present this as a winnable prize with no fine print showing that you actually can't get this as a winnable prize. You can't just turn around and be like, "Yeah, I'm I'm reneging on the offer. We were just kidding." You can't implement the just kidding defense. In points and added a just kidding disclaimer. Giving the internet the task of naming something historically hasn't gone too well. These naming contests seem to always get hijacked resulting in a funny but sometimes inappropriate name getting voted as the winner. In 2007... They 100%, they had a list of prizes you could claim and it wasn't there, but it was on the commercial. They 100% should have been forced by the court, which by the way, that's the same district, not suspiciously enough, I hope you understand, that also falsely imprisoned uh, our boy for, uh, for successfully suing... I always say Exxon, but it's actually Chevron, right? Steven Donzinger. It was Chevron, yes. To prove your point, they update price in the commercial instead of saying it's not included.
They didn't cash his check of Monopoly money. Lol, what's the counter offer? Hey, kid, here's 500 bicycles. Yeah, I, I... What damages would there be when they just send him back his money? No, you can't just, like, fucking kick someone out of this competition when they've already purchased so much. They've spent so much time purchasing the fucking Pepsi shit. They literally got other investors involved. Like... In that situation, I think that they should legally have to. Uh, obviously, you would bargain against that, but you would, you should be able to argue that they have to give you the price of the jet. Like they have to give you uh, cash compensation. They're never going to give the actual price of the jet because that's thirty-seven million dollars. So instead, they'll probably give you like half of that or something. He dodged a bullet. Harriers are a nightmare for maintenance, and we spend too much on the plane itself and too much time teaching new mechanics how to fix it. All right, let's see if it works. Uh-oh. The play button is still not clickable. Uh-oh. Nope. Oh, launching. 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 It launched. One day later. All right. We're going to get back to when contests go horribly wrong, and we're going to finish out this AM Glimpse video from yesterday where we talked about the Philippines causing riots with the Pepsi. Uh, Pepsi also lying to the American public by not offering a fucking Harrier to one beautiful, bold American dared the dream and last but not least we're gonna move on i guess this portion is for greenpeace sometimes inappropriate name getting voted as the winner in 2007 greenpeace asked the internet to name the humpback whale that was being tracked in the south pacific ocean the name mr splashy pants won by a landslide earning 78 percent of the votes in 2016 the UK's Natural Environment Research Council famously asked the internet to name its newest ship, resulting in Bodie McFoot Boat Boat Face Boat winning Face. the popular vote. The ship ended up being named after Sir David Attenborough, but its smaller, remotely operated vessel was named Bodie McBoatface. In Boys! 2011, the city of Fort Wayne, Indiana hosted an online vote to name a new government building, and the name of a real former mayor, Harry Balls, was the runaway favorite. Despite the fact that Mr. Balls was a respected mayor who served four terms in the 1930s and 50s, the city opted to name the building Citizen Square. Also in 2011, the city of Austin, Texas asked its citizens to rename its Solid Waste Department. The majority of votes went to Fred Durst Society of the Humanities and Arts. After the frontman of the band uh -huh. Limp Bizkit, the city rejected this and decided to use the name that came in second place, Department of Neat and Clean. In 2000... You noticed by him? The reason why they didn't do that wasn't because they were Fred Durst fans. They were like, no, there's shit here. We're dealing with shit and sanitation and trash here. Limp Bizkit is significantly worse. He's like, you dared... You dare not besmirch the good name of trash by comparing it to Limp Bizkit. In 2009, Kraft decided to ask Australians to come up with the name for its new cheese flavor of Vegemite. The name that somehow had the most votes was iSnack 2.0. Kraft actually ended up going with it and the new product was rolled out, leading to widespread confusion and outrage. It seemed that most people didn't think the name would be taken seriously. A second vote was held to fix the mistake. The ultimate winner was Cheesy Bite. Perhaps the most infamous naming contest in internet history was Mountain Dew's Dub the Dew campaign. Uh -oh. In 2012, the fast food chain Villa Italian Kitchen launched the promotion on its website asking fans to submit and vote for a name for the new green apple flavor of Mountain Dew that would be available exclusively at their stores. It didn't take long for 4chan users to flood the website with suggestions such as Soylent Green, Methamphetamine Green, Hulk's Filthy Residue, Pepsi, many granny-centric names, as well as hundreds of others that are definitely not YouTube advertised. Oh, I was about to say, like, genuinely shocking to me that there wasn't a Hitler reference, but of course, it was the number one. Okay, got it. It's a friendly. On August 13th, 2012, an anonymous user posted about the Mountain Dew poll and urged others to vote. Mustache Man did nothing wrong to number one. The Dub the Dew website also got hacked around this time, resulting in the addition of a Rickroll video pop-up, as well as a message at the top of the page that we also won't be risking reading out loud. Wait, what? That's crazy. He can't say Mountain Dew salutes the Israel Masafir demolishing three towers on 9-11. Holy fuck, Haas showing his inability to hear music again. Limp Biscuit slaps. Brother, you can't say that. Loud. 
The following day, Mountain Dew tweeted about, quote, losing to the internet and how they were helping Villa Italian Kitchen handle the fiasco. The website was taken down and the campaign was not relaunched. In March 2013, the new flavor was released as simply Apple Mountain Dew, but a year later was renamed to Electric Apple. In March 2020, 32-year-old father of three, Muhammad Shalahan, eagerly called into Singapore radio station Gold905 to play the celebrity name drop game with the hopes of winning $10,000. Players had to listen closely to a montage of 14 different celebrities' voices, each saying a word of the phrase Gold905, the station that sounds good and makes you feel good. Over the last few weeks, people would call in with their guesses, while those listening along would take note of any correct answers and try and piece the puzzle together. Muhammad called in hundreds of times and had made it on air twice, but on April 21st, 2020, he knew he finally had all the right answers. Yeah, so I, I think I'm gonna win it this time round. Wow, I hope so. Now, I can only play you the clip once, so listen very closely. Are you ready? Yes, I am. I feel like these marketing campaigns were successful anyway. They had everyone talking in controversy to just amplify them. Um, when was the Mountain Dew 4chan one? Because I feel like that is the turning point for a lot of the 4chan stuff. Like, like back then it was like trolly. Yeah, 2012. So I, I think like that was like 4chan doing like lol Hitler memes, right? And then, like, by 2015, 2016, it was literally like, oh, no, actually, we like that. Like, we, we unironically are that. You know what I mean? There's a point in the history of not even just 4chan, but, like, poll, where uh, poll unironically and, and 4chan unironically across the board goes from, like, a bunch of, you know, neurodivergent kids uh, hanging out online under the guise of anonymity saying a bunch of unhinged shit with, like, some people memeing about it but most people not memeing about it to like everyone being like, no, 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 we're serious about this. It's kind of wild when you think about it. It's kind of wild when you think about it because like 4chan is literally responsible for QAnon. 4chan lore is when My Little Pony took over 4chan in 2011, 2012. It splintered into MLP and Hitler kids. HD, that was us. It's something awful. We were first. 4chan is also someone responsible for, like, multiple deaths. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, they, they're they responsible for a lot. I mean, it's not, like, one nerd, right? It's not one nerd that uh, that caused any of this shit. But it is certainly a bunch of them that uh, were able to take advantage of, of brigading. That's it. That's pretty much it. Brigading wasn't invented by 4chan or anything but like brigading still to this day is very easily uh it's it's very easily done you can absolutely brigade shit to change uh the the uh attitude that people have towards a particular subject matter like you can do it all the time it doesn't take that much it's basically uh it is basically i would say what like a hundred people that are super dedicated to be able to brigade most things online okay here it goes go nine oh five the station sounds good and makes you feel good okay have you got the names yes go ahead okay number one tony headley <laughs> number two madonna <laughs> number three maggie wheeler <laughs> number four ellen degeneres Number five, Jim Carrey. Number six, George Clooney. Number seven, David Bowie. Number eight, Belinda Carlyle. Number nine, Julie Andrews. Number ten, Lionel Richie. Number eleven, Stevie Wonder. Number twelve, Meryl Streep. Number thirteen, Michael Bublé. Number 14, Rebecca Lim. Check with the judge now. Hey, Shalihan, you got 13 correct names. 13 of them in the correct place. Oh, Not bad. Yeah. Keep working on it. All the best. Okay, sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Unfortunately, he was still one answer off. On what? May 6th, another caller, Jerome Tan, made his guesses. 
Okay, number one, Tony Hadley. Number two, Madonna. Number three, Maggie Wheeler. Number four, Ellen DeGeneres. Wait, so once he just put that out there, once he puts that out there, I don't understand. Like, it just doesn't matter. Number five, Jim Carrey. Number six, George Clooney. Number seven, David Bowie. Number eight, Belinda Carlisle. Number nine, Julie Andrews. Number 10, Lionel Richie. Number 11, Stevie Wonder. Number 12, Meryl Streep. Number 13, Michael Bublé. Number 14, Rebecca Lim. Let's hear from the judge. Wait, what? Jerome said the exact same answers as Muhammad, but he was the one who ended up as the winner. Confused, what? Muhammad contacted the station to ask why he hadn't won and was told that his pronunciation of the name Tony Hadley was incorrect. Here is a side-by-side -side comparison of how Muhammad and Jerome pronounce the name. Dude, I would fucking lose my mind. Oh my God. That is so... Oh my God. I would do illegal things at that point. Tony Hadley. Tony Hadley. Other listeners also noticed that Muhammad had all the correct names back in April and took to social media to urge the station to make things right. Some even believed that Jerome had pronounced the name Belinda Carlisle incorrectly. Many pointed out, Singapore uniquely has four official languages and a blend of accents. So variations of tones and pronunciations are common and accepted. However, the radio station doubled down on their decision and maintained that Muhammad mispronounced Tony Hadley and therefore could not be declared the winner. That's crazy, bro. They fucking went, they went the racism route. They were like, nah, fuck it, YOLO. We're just going extra races with it. Fuck you. Fucking pieces of shit. Please tell me there's some restitution. The issue was getting significant attention online and Muhammad felt Jeopardy does pronunciation to its bullshit. No, he fuck had that. enough support behind him to reach out to Tony Hadley himself the former lead singer of English new wave band Spandau Ballet. To his surprise, Tony Hadley not only responded, but sent a video confirming that his pronunciation was correct. Hi, Mohammed, Mohammed Shellahan. This is Tony Hadley here from the UK. Now I've listened back to the tape and as far as I'm concerned, you pronounce my name absolutely correctly. Tony Hadley, you might have said Hadley, it's slight accent, but as far as I'm concerned, you know, you, you, you said my name correctly. So you should be entitled to, to whatever the, the, the prize was. I mean, That's I'm not on bullshit, the dude. So I can't get involved to any extent. But as far as I'm concerned, you pronounced my name correctly. Gold905 acknowledged Tony Hadley's video, but reiterated that Muhammad's answer was not correct and that they're just Dude, why are they so adamant, dude? Okay, it's going to come out that the second guy is like related to the... DJ or something, right? Like, what is happening? Actually, what the fuck is going on? They're tripling down. They need to be punished. They need to be punished for this. Jeopardy well, clawing back a correct clues, answer Jeopardy because of pronunciation. Lost a lot of money because of two letters. That's right. He pronounced uh, the word gangsta apparently incorrectly. Take a listen to this. What is gangsters paradise lost? Yes. Our judges have reevaluated one of your responses a few moments ago, Nick. You said gangsters instead of gangstas on that song by Coolio. So we take 3,200 away from you. So you are now in second place. Oh, my God. That's fucked up. Dog, that shit is fucked up, dude. That is fucked up. Even then... The Tony Headley thing, way worse. Okay? Way worse. You understand? Gangsters is like the name of the official thing. You know what I mean? Okay, Saul. Yeah, this one's not about a pronunciation. It's just the word. Uh, it don't matter. I still think it's fucked up. However, 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 however. The other one is way worse. This other one is way fucking worse, dog. Are you kidding me? Decision was final. 
However, the station announced they would offer Muhammad five thousand dollars as a consolation prize. Nope, not price, enough. Fuck that. Half the nope. amount of the full prize. Nope, give him the full prize, bitch. No shot. No consolation. Full price. And then one and a half price, actually. Full price plus another half for the inconvenience that you put my mans through. Muhammad was on a modest salary as a railway worker, and his wife was pregnant with their fourth baby. So he was unsure whether to accept the offer or continue to push for the full $10,000. The story had gathered even more momentum online after Tony Hadley himself backed up Muhammad, and many were calling for an apology and for the decision to be overturned. On May 22nd, 2020, Gold905 finally relented and announced that they would be awarding Muhammad Shalahan his rightful prize of $10,000. Wait, that that contest didn't go wrong. Okay, that contest went right. Okay, that's good. A lot of people think the CIA planted this to cause racial tensions in Singapore. Wait, what? JK, I made that up. I don't know what I'm saying. Uh, like, what the fuck?